So we'll start off. Six thirty, and John just put up our webinar hashtag two. Great. Well, um, I am going to go ahead and get started with our webinar this evening. Um, we'll for sure have some folks coming in and as we're as I'm talking, but we want to make sure to be sensitive to value um, and your precious time out there and, and the different coasts. Some of you, I guess, are coming to us where it's 7.30 and some of you are coming to us where it's 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, here in St. Paul or Minneapolis, Minnesota, it's 6.30 p.m. We've got a nice dusting of snow on the ground and i um, looking forward to some more in a little bit. So welcome to everyone out there to the very first Will Steger Foundation Climate and Energy Literacy Webinar. Um, we have some folks typing a greetings in on the corner there. If you want to just um, <laughs> introduce yourself uh, through the chat throughout the program, that's totally welcome. Um, and interacting with each other and asking questions is welcome as well. If you have not checked out the other three webinars in our four-part series, please do. And we'll be giving you that um, web address throughout the evening in different forms. But um, we've got a great lineup ahead of us featuring some high school students and their teacher talking about integrating climate, international climate policy next month. Um, we have the following month, Josh Stegman from the Department of Energy, um, the Einstein Fellow, talking about energy literacy. And then we have um, Minda Bar Barbaco from National Center for Science Education coming to us on their last webinar talking about the National Climate Assessment and um, as a tool for educators. So we've got a great lineup. We're really looking forward to this evening. Um, and we're excited that you are here with us. Because this is our first, we are mentally prepared for some glitches, although we've been practicing forever and we are confident that this will all come off pretty well, but please let us know if you do have any problems in the chat box, like I said, or, or give John a call in the number above. And so this up here are your hosts this evening. You can see myself and then John Smith, who's the um, faceless um, person behind all this, making sure that we all run smoothly. So many thanks to John Smith this evening. Um, during this evening's webinar, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box in the bottom. John will be collecting them throughout the webinar, and we have some time set aside to, to, answer, um, to answer those questions. Um, one of our goals for this webinar series is really not to just provide you with um, provoking content, but also to provide those of you that are educators with some resources to really take what you've learned and share it with your students or whatever audience that you work with. And so in addition to Will's eyewitness, which he'll be sharing with you, we'll be following up with a few climate change education resources. Um, so before we go any further, I'm just gonna broadcast the results. I think all of you should be able to see um, so far um, what you've said, why you're, you're here today. It looks like the top reason why folks are here today is climate change is an important topic for them. Um, but we have some people out there interested <coughs> in, excited to learn about education resources and some Will Steger fans too. So welcome to all of you for being, being here this evening. So let me tell you before we go to Will, just a little bit about the Will Steger Foundation. Um, the Will Steger Foundation was founded in 2006 and our unique story really stems from our founder, Will Steger, who you'll get to hear here, um, who uses his compelling eyewitness account of the consequences of a warming world in the Arctic and Antarctic as a means to engage people on this issue of climate change and solutions to climate change. Uh, building on Will's experience as a polar explorer and an eyewitness to climate change, the Will Steger Foundation educates, inspires, and empowers people to engage in solutions to climate change. Our, our education program has evolved over the years. We actually started out with um, a focus on expeditions with Will. And although we are no longer doing those expeditions, we really stay committed to the idea of eyewitness accounts and the metaphor of the expedition. The mission of our program is to support educators, students, and the public with science-based interdisciplinary resources on climate change, 
its implications and solutions to achieve climate literacy. And we do this through curriculum that we offer through our website to download for free, um, as well as provide in workshops and institutes, which are our professional development opportunities. You are all participating actually in one of those opportunities this evening. And we also have uh, a wide variety of online resources I encourage you to check out and work with a number of educational partners really to, to broaden our reach and to strengthen our program. So Will Steger, <clears throat> for those of you who uh, know Will here in Minnesota, he's well known and he's known internationally. He's a recognized authority on the polar regions, including its environmental issues, he is also an eyewitness to the effects of global warming. He has spent more than 50 years traveling through the Arctic regions, advocating for the Earth's preservation and advising on permanent solutions to climate change. Steger holds a Bachelor of Science in Geology and a Master of Arts in Education from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, in addition to five honorary doctorates. As an educator, Steger taught science for three years at the secondary level and then went on to combine his passion for education with his expeditions and future projects. As an explorer, Will led the first confirmed dog sled journey to the North Pole without resupply in 1986. The 1,600 mile South North Traverse of Greenland, which is the longest unsupported dog sled expedition in history, in 1988, and led the dog sled traverse of Antarctica which was a historic seven month, 3,741 mile international trans and Arctic expedition from 1989 to 90. Will has continued his commitment to the environment and education through the Will Steger Foundation by inspiring and empowering people to engage in solutions to climate change. Steger joins Amelia Earhart, Robert Peary, and Ronald Amundsen, and receiving the National Geographic Society's prestigious John Oliver Lagorce Medal for accomplishments in geographic exploration in the sciences and public service to advance international understanding in 1995. And this was the first time the society presented all three categories and this award has not been given since. So without further ado, I am very pleased to introduce Will Steger and as I mentioned earlier, um, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat box during Will's presentation and we will, we will take time to answer them. Okay. <laughs> Are we on now? <laughs> That's it, John. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. I'm um, I'm sorry I can't see you out there. <laughs> it's kind of strange talking to a blank screen here, but I know I know there's about 42 of you out there here. So this is our first webinar here at the Gold Seeker Foundation. Um, it's history. You know, it's the first time we've we've done this, and hopefully uh, we won't have any um, any problems. And if we have problems, it's part of the process here. And um, I started the Will Steger Foundation. Actually, we were incorporated in 06. I started working on it in 04 out of the concern uh, for what I was seeing in the polar regions. Uh, the scientists predicted that the uh, ice would first be uh, affected by climate change. And uh, I literally have been on that ice. And what I wanted to show you today was uh, my eyewitness account. But um, I started as a very young kid. Um, these are some of my journals back in 1957, if you can believe that, when I was um, uh, 12 or 13 years old. Um, uh, actually, my parents were good enough to allow me to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to watch the shooting stars, as you can see, uh, if, you're, if you can read, read the screen there. And then actually on the top entry on October 4th, 1957, uh, that was a, a very historical day for all of us. Russia launched the first satellite, and uh, and that changed the whole world. And that's uh, the reason why we're, uh, at least I'm talking here today. So, uh, but I was a young kid at that day and and participating in that. And and I've always liked uh, I always liked journals and uh, observing my my observations. And uh, that's been a big big important important part of myself when I was younger. Um, I always sketched, uh, I researched and sketched. I found by sketching uh, flowers or whatever it was I was interested in, 
uh, that was a really a good way of, of getting that in my memory. Everything that I sketched, I know very intimately. I, mean, I look at these flowers and remember the dates when I did that, and and I, I remember the moth and, and all this. But this was very important to me as a kid. And, and through the Will Seeger Foundation, uh, we've done uh, Minnesota's Changing Climate, which was around uh, young people going out to observing. Uh, observation is something I think that's very important and maybe missing in a way today in our education because of the computer screen. But the but the, the going out to observing, noting, drawing, and uh, along with our, our um, curriculum, the young people were able to share that, which is very important. The social aspect of this is important. Uh, this is my North Pole journal back in 1986. Uh, uh, we had temperatures down to 72 to below zero. And uh, you notice the different color inks there? Well, the problem here was the ink would freeze. So normally I would get about, you, as you can see there, maybe about seven lines out before the ink was frozen. Then I would have to put that back in my shirt, take out a red pen and write that until that froze. So, uh, but I kept the full journal. I, I've journaled um, every expedition I've been on out of a uh, love of writing, but also out of a discipline, uh, at least 45 minutes to an hour each morning I, I observed and a, a journaled, uh, which has really paid off for me. And this is in the tents here, 20 years ago, writing uh, on the North Pole and on the way to the pole. Um, we made breakthroughs in technology, uh, actually way before the internet. Uh, my life changed in 1987 when I worked with Al Gore on environmental issues. And he gave me the white papers or the study papers on this thing called, it was called actually the information highway back then. And in 87, in 1987, I saw that was going to change my life because um, I would have really retired out of expeditions early in my life because I didn't have any way of sharing uh, these incredible things that I was seeing. Uh, but it was through the internet in the very beginning here. This was actually a, a, a mechanism where we could type in uh, a journal and then we would send that out on the radio. And uh, so it was like receiving a, a fax on the radio and this radio message would go to Churchill, Manitoba, where they actually had a computer link. This is back in 92. And then we were able to get it on uh, into the classroom. So it was all sorts of uh, uh, kind of different ways we had to do it until finally around 1994 and that the, the internet got connected. This is up in uh, Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. This is the first uh, inter internet transmission from the, from the far north, from the Northwest Territories. Actually, the territories um, way up north, they were uh, leaders uh, in the internet because they saw the opportunity of connecting their schools to the outside world through this because that, that was what was missing to the young kids up there. They didn't have contact to the outside world. The internet, uh, of course, changed that. You can see the, by the looks of the kids. These are Inuit kids here. Of uh, uh, This is the fascination of what they were seeing. They're connecting with some kids in, down in Ohio of their own age group. and. Uh, this is uh, 1995. Uh, this is, again, a historical moment. Uh, it was the actual first interaction through the internet from the North Pole. I mean, the fact that the two women here were educators, Takako and, and Julie, interacting, laughing back and forth uh, with a classroom in Ohio and Indiana. I mean, something we take all this for granted, but just to, to, to have an emotional response back and forth was uh, pretty historical, especially from the, from the North Pole. We were, able to really teach a lot about that. And then I extended that on over the years. This is in 08. Um, I traveled with um, six young uh, explorers. These, these young people were really, uh, um, really qualified, highly skilled. A lot of them been to both poles, kite skiers. I traveled with six from uh, uh, three different countries and we did an internet project. And the key there was, was for um, the younger people to work with their peers. Peer to peer level is really the way to do it. Uh, that way, they're interested socially in what they're doing, and they're also interested in the in the content. And um, we experienced on that expedition in, in 08 here, uh, the summer of 07, the Arctic Ocean broke up. I mean, this was historical, and 50% of that ice broke up. This was the ice of the Arctic Ocean, but it was in the wrong place. It floated down in between the major islands in Canada, which was kind of a historical picture here. And then um, lots of rough ice along the way. Uh, this was actually an ice shelf that broke off from northern uh, Ellesmere two years before this, and it drifted 600 miles. It's sitting in the sea ice, which is like, you, you can't realize this, but this is like a part of a polar plateau 
in the ocean in the wrong place. And that, that's these are some of the things that I've seen. But we were able to transmit and talk about this through the internet, which was really exciting. And uh, and we owe it to our younger people too to uh, provide them right the right education and solutions. This this of course is the rise of carbon dioxide. You can see from the bottom, 1960, uh, uh, 2000. 14 here, we're actually at 400 parts per million. But if you can look at on the left-hand side there and see 350, that's 350 parts per million. If you draw that line across, you can see we reached 350 parts per million in 1990. That was critical because the scientists predicted at 350 parts per million, the ice would start melting and this would change the heat balance of the globe. And that's what I wanted to show you here, uh, kind of firsthand here today here. Uh, of course, the culprit is um, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, burning of coal is a real bad, uh, any type of fossil fuels, but coal is the worst. Uh, here in Minnesota, we still get about 57% of our energy from coal. So um, I may talk, have time to talk about solutions later on, but um, I'll take you on an expedition here. Uh, this is an international team, six people from six different countries. We did a 3,700-mile traverse of Antarctica. I think I have a picture there. there. That's 3,700 miles across. Um, we did this in 220 days. Um, we, uh, we, we, this was actually before the internet was really up and running. Uh, we actually had over a, over a billion people following us on the, uh, that's, that's a fifth of the earth was following us via various media. I don't have a pointer here, but the large part of Antarctica there that you see is called the Eastern Plateau. It's 3,000 miles across, 2,000 2, miles, uh, two, 2 miles thick. Uh, out to the left of that, uh, is, a, is a smaller ice shell, uh, ice cap, thousand by thousand miles. Let me see what we got here. The next picture here, I can. Let me see here. One, excuse me here, a little technical. There we are. It's kind of hard to do this without a pointer, but you see the colored areas there. Let's look at the Ross. See the Ross? This is a, actually the Ross ice shelf, size of France. Um, large areas of the glaciers f actually flow right in over the ocean, and that caps the ocean. There's a thousand foot thick uh, layer of ice shelf. This is right at the sea level, and maybe a couple hundred mi a couple hundred feet above uh, the sea level, and it extends down to maybe seven, eight hundred feet. These uh, ice shelves buttress against the continent, essentially keeping all this ice and glaciers in, in place. The problem that we're having with climate change now are these ice shelves are starting to break off. Uh, if you can look up towards your upper left, the Larsen ice shelf, yellow, uh, that whole area broke off. We, it took us uh, uh, three weeks to cross that in uh, 89. I'll show you some pictures of that here. Uh, this is a, this is a like, called a steady state of a frozen country. Is basically you get the evaporation from the open ocean. Uh, that vapor goes over the glaciers, the uh, high plateau, uh, falls in the form of snow, accumulates, of course, over thousands of years. And then that flows out over the ocean. And you can see that ice, it's ice shelf flowing over the ocean. It naturally breaks up uh, off after uh, a certain distance on the open water. But what's happening now, uh, these ice shelves are breaking right close to the coast. And then the, the snow and ice in the back of that is starting to, starting to disappear. Um, we're going to look at the top of, of the Antarctic Peninsula here. Uh, it's it's uh, 300 miles across. That red line there was... Uh, uh, route that we took, uh, the route across that. If you, the state of Minnesota basically would fit in that if you're a Minnesota person here. Uh, but I think I have, there we go. I want to show you the uh, satellite photos of this ice shelf disintegrating. This was in January 31st, as you read above, uh, 2002. Um, we're looking at an area in that square, which I'm going to take a look at. That's the area. Uh, it took us 1500, uh, 15 days to cross this. And uh, this ice shelf has been around for about 12,000 years, 700 feet thick. And what we're looking at over a four week period, month of February in 02, this entire ice shelf uh, disintegrated into the ocean. I think I've got one more picture here to show that. Right there it is, it's gone. I mean, this was like uh, that day or a week after that, I was looking at our local newspaper, Minneapolis Tribune, paging in the 11th page or so. And the title of the, the headlines was Larson uh, Ice Shelf Disintegrates. And this is something that I, I just couldn't conceive. <laughs> was I reading the reading the right headline? And, and it actually, this whole area that took us three weeks to cross disintegrated in one month. And this was because of the temperature 
in the currents of the ocean. Now, what does that mean? Well, the ice is floating that disintegrated, so the ocean isn't rising. But now, um, the, since the ice is gone, in the lower left there, you'll see these glaciers. These are some of the longest glaciers in the world. In fact, we crossed one of them, the Weyerhaeuser Glacier, 125 miles long. Uh, these glaciers now are flowing very quickly into the ocean. And for the first time here, just a few years back, uh, we're starting to see a rise to the sea level because of this ice, not just ice, just ice in Antarctica, but the ice in Greenland. I think I've got a shot here at Greenland. Uh, yeah, this is the Greenland ice cap. Um, if you've ever flown to uh, uh, Europe, you probably might have flown over Greenland, taking a look at it here. It's the largest uh, island in the world. It's the second largest ice cap from uh, the southern part to the top is 1,600 miles. Uh, I've crossed Greenland twice, uh, won the long route unsupported, and again in 19, uh, or 2008, which I'll show you. But we're looking at here in 1992, the red areas um, represent the summer thaws. In other words, in 1992, the thawing level thawed went up to about 800 feet, which was a normal, would have been a normal year. Now, if we push this ahead uh, uh, 10 years, we can see that the thawing levels going up to, in this case, up to about 4,000 4, feet. And 2005 here, uh, we're up to the 5,000, almost the 6,000 foot range. And then this next one was a year ago last summer. <clears throat> We actually had a thaw right up to the very top of the Greenland ice cap, 10,300 feet. And uh, this is something that's never happened since the Green, Greenland ice cap has been around. Uh, and what does this mean? Well, it means we have a lot of water that's melting, but you, you don't break up a ice cap, uh, 10,000 uh, 10, feet of ice cap in a short summer. But the water is what, what the culprit is. The water accumulates uh, in small little lakes. Uh, these overflow. And then you have running water on the ice. Again, gravity takes hold here. And within five to 10 miles, this water go, forms its old holes, goes through what's called mullins. And this water goes all the way through the ice cap down to the bottom of the ice cap, where it, then it follows the bottom, which, which uh, um, lubricates the bottom of, of the ice cap. And then at the ocean side here, we have huge calving, a lot of, lot of ice going. I think I have an illustration of that. No, I don't. Uh, rather than the illustration here, I have a video. It's probably even better. Um, Johnny, do you want to run that? In 2008, um, I formed a kite skiing expedition in the summertime to cross Greenland. I, I wanted to see firsthand what this looked like. I traveled with three 21 to 23 year olds from Canada and Norway. These were the top polar kiters in the world. Um, I was a student, I was their student. And uh, we were training here. Basically, you, you uh, control the kite by the handles like this. You, you wear a helmet. Uh, you're traveling pretty fast. Uh, we're training here. We don't have our sleds with us quite yet here. And um, whenever the wind's blowing, we travel. We travel generally you know, 24 hours to 36 hours straight on. We, we take a break every three or four hours. And, uh, and the distance that we might cover anywhere from 100 to 150 miles. Um, <clears throat> we uh, have a range of around 2,000 miles. I mean, you can travel almost, a few, well, you can travel the full length of Greenland there if you're prepared for it. And, uh, but using this method of the kites, uh, we skied over the top of the, of the, of the ice, ice cap here. We're, you know, we're pulling 220 pound loads here. You know, we're going about 12 miles an hour in this, in this picture. So it's a, great way. It's uh, not as easy as dog sledding because you're doing all the work. But then we got over on the other side in, in mid-July. This is the be beginning of the thawing season. This is up at 6,700 feet and uh, at that time that was a, a record. They never had a thaw uh, up at that, that height at that early uh, in, the, uh, in the season. Uh, we were able to get around a lot of these uh, smaller creeks but then as the, like a mountain range, the creeks form streams and the streams get bigger. Uh, we had a really hard time getting around this open water like this. But what is really strange, if you listen to the sound of running water, this is something you never hear on an ice cap. It's a sign of a, it's a sound of an ice cap that's disintegrating. And then these are, this is a river, uh, three quarters of a mile wide. If you notice on the upper left here, notice it disappears. It just 
Rose Center. This is another one. We're on an airplane here, by the way. Um, we're up about 4,000 feet above the surface. This river is really deep. It flowed for a while. It formed like a Grand Canyon. It dug out this, carved out this huge canyon, and then then that disappeared uh, into the ocean, uh, in, in, through the ice. This is when we got near the ocean. Uh, we're, we're in land here. Uh, this is uh, a natural occurrence, which is called calving. Calving is where the glaciers break off on the ocean front, uh, which is unnatural here, uh, is the amount of calving. This, this is just a small section here. This is like almost uh, 17, 1800 feet tall here. It's a mile long. And uh, all day long as we sat here, we, we watched these huge pieces, one after another, breaking off. And uh, really, really quite dramatic. Um, what you're seeing here is is the beginning of the great sea level rise. Um, as of 2007, we started absorb, uh, they were starting to absorb more energy than giving out, melting this ice again, like over 300, almost four parts per million. And uh, this is something that is not too major quite yet, although our storm surges are powerful because the sea level is rising, but this is something that's going to plague our civilization uh, for the rest of our history. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to be around for a long time, but we're going to have to adapt to the changes that we have occurred. In fact, we are no longer in the Ice Age system. We've probably been in Ice Ages for 20 million years, but the Ice Age cycle is over with. And uh, we'll turn to another video. I think we have it. John, do you do I push a button here? Or do you you okay we're john's working on this one here there we are the jim bay log okay they do a little stand-up economy work okay this is a friend of mine jim bay log does the movie did a movie chasing ice he sets up remote cameras solar powered that sit there for a whole year and they take these time-lapse photographs you're looking at a glacier three miles long you know, across one mile long, that would be three miles you know, across it, one mile thick. You're seeing this break up in a matter of 75 minutes. This ice is 3,000 feet thick that you're looking at. And uh, it was quite an incredible piece of photography. He's going to zoom out here. We'll get a size comparison, exactly what we looked at. And uh, 75 minutes, that's the key here. One mile retreat three miles wide, and uh, we have a thickness at three-fifths of a mile thick. This is a huge volume. Events like this go on often, but nobody's there to, to see them. And this is the White House here, or U.S. Capitol here as a size comparison. Huge volume. And that adds that, that adds to the, uh, the sea level rise, and then See here, I think I can get out of there. There we go. I got one more area I want to talk about, and it's the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the North Pole is about in the white area there, all white is the Arctic Ocean. Uh, it's about the center of that is the North Pole. Uh, it's the size of the United States and, and um, Mexico combined. Um, I spent over a thousand days of my career on this ice, on the various moving ice, basically where the, where the polar bears uh, live very familiar with this area. And the ice on the Arctic Ocean is in, always in motion. Anywhere from uh, three to eight miles a day, it moves um, on a storm, might, might get as much as 20 miles. So when you're on it, you're, you're moving. Uh, before the advent of the GPS, you couldn't tell you were moving, but with the GPS, you can actually see, you know, how many feet you're moving a minute and then also your direction. But here, what we're doing is two of these huge plates that come together here, this is an act of movement here, and we're trying to figure out a route. And there's a little silhouette in the distance. My friend Victor is going way out in the long run, finding a route there. But we're trying to get a, a route right over through this immediate area. Where the ice comes together, you get these pressure ridges. Uh, and we cross hundreds of these on, when, on a crossing. Um, and then if the wind changes, the ice actually separates. You get open water even at 50 below up there uh, when the ice um, splits up. We like to travel when at the coldest time of the year. 50 below is ideal, actually, because when this ice breaks up like this, it freezes rather quickly. But uh, this surface of the ice, though, we've seen some major changes. Um, starting in the 90s, um, 
we witnessed, experienced a, a lot of open water, and it became very dangerous uh, crossing these areas with, with dog teams. Um, we had sleds go in, dogs go in, people go in. Uh, it just got to be too bad. And, and today, you can no longer reach the North Pole by uh, dog team because of the open water. You do have to travel uh, in, a, in some form of flotation. This is a canoe, we call a canoe sled, a canoe with runners on it. Our uh, other other expeditions actually use uh, um, uh, pulks or sleds that do float, and uh, then you get over it that way. This is the uh, the land land that you're looking at here is the northern northernmost area of North America. We made a crossing from the Russian side. We went all, all the way over. This is in July, so we're coming down here to the uh, North America. This was really uh, for us also quite a sight. Um, this picture here is um, a site that I never thought I, I would see or actually participate in. We're actually canoeing on the Arctic Ocean. And uh, this was in 1995. This whole area should have been, uh, you know, should have been frozen. <laughs> uh, let's see, do we have a video here, John? Okay. <clears throat> let's see here. What we got? Yeah, this shows the... Uh, ice retreat over the last 30 years or so. Uh, upper left, you can see the years. Uh, the 80s were normal years. Uh, the retreat would happen in August, end of September. Notice in the 90s now uh, that summer sea ice is becoming a little less. Some, some years with a lot of ice, but as we get into the 2000 era, we'll see a big break up here in 07, notice in 07. Uh, we had another major breakup right there in 2012. That was a, the least amount of ice. Um, let's see, we pulled, check here, see what we got next year. This is what we're looking at on the Arctic Ocean. 20 years ago, when things were normal, uh, in the summertime, about 90, 95% of the ice on the Arctic Ocean, 95% uh, of, the, of the surface was snow or ice. And then you have five months of 24 hour light. So that's uh, blue sky all the time for five months. And there's a, a tremendous amount, as you would imagine, over that huge area, tremendous amount of solar radiation coming down on the Earth. Well, that all used to reflect off. And that gave us a normal climate that we've had for the last five to 7,000 years. And uh, because of this normal climate, uh, our species flourished. Uh, agricultural developed, other technologies like that developed. And that was an, a normal situation for 7,000 years. But then from the burning of fossil fuels, that second to the top picture there would have been in the 90s where you saw the sled in the water. That's when we started to get some thawing of the ice and some open water. But once you get open water, which is a darker surface, more energy uh, absorbs. So the, the more, more open water, the more melting, the more melting, the more open water. <clears throat> then the second to the bottom, uh, diagram would be 2007. 2007, we had a major breakup. 50% of the Arctic Ocean uh, broke up at that summer. And unfortunately, what broke up was the uh, multi-year ice, the ice that has been around for you know, 12, 13 years. This multi-year ice is actually the breeding ice of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the majority of that, probably 75% of that, broke up that one particular year. And that changed everything. Ever since then, uh, in the summers, uh, we've had between 40, 40, 45, and 55 percent of that ice has been gone. Uh, last year was a record year, and then on the bottom uh, is what's predicted. Probably within the, unfortunately, the next five or ten years, we're going to have an ice-free Arctic Ocean in the summertime. Again, when the sun sets in September, um, it gets cold again. That ice freezes, but now when it freezes, it's relatively thin. Uh, and then when the summer starts up, that ice breaks up really, really quickly. So if we look at this, this is what we're looking at, a tipping point. You have what was once a reflective surface turning into an absorptive surface. And then that is increasing the heat. And uh, uh, some of us that are in Minnesota, we've experienced some really super cold weather. Uh, what's called the polar vortex is broken up. What's happening here, if you look at the bottom picture, um, you have a lot of energy. Uh, accumulating in the ocean, it's absorbed. 
So when the sun sets in September, October, in the polar regions, normally the temperature would drop to 40 below right away. But now when it sets, it's got all this latent heat in the water itself. And this energy is radiating up, and that is uh, one of our causes what's destabilizing the weather systems. Our, our jet stream, uh, the jet stream is becoming weaker, and then that allows these outbursts of cold weather. It's, it's almost like opening up a refrigerator door that cold comes right up. The jet stream is like a, uh, almost like a, a fence, but that's getting weaker. So we're having what we call it climate change. You're getting colder weather in certain areas, but then warmer areas in other areas. So it's quite variable. Let's see what we got next year. And then this is the permafrost areas here. The, 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 uh, the hazy area, of course, of the Arctic Ocean, uh, but then the white area on the continent itself, with the exception of Greenland, uh, is permanently frozen uh, swamp. Uh, and this is uh, mostly frozen uh, uh, methane. Uh, you have organic material. Uh, and when it's in a, a permafrost state, it doesn't interact with the uh, atmosphere. But if the uh, atmosphere warms up, which it's doing now in the Arctic, uh, this permafrost starts melting and that releases methane. So that's another another major problem here that we're looking at. Um, at the end, maybe questions and answers, we can talk about solutions because I, I don't want to, looking at a doomsday here, there are solutions to this, uh, but we first have to look at the reality. And uh, we're starting to see it uh, in our own backyard. Here in Minnesota, uh, we had a couple of years ago a really dry uh, drought here. We had a huge fires up in northern Minnesota. This particular forest fire was near my home in Ely, Minnesota. This fire ran 18 miles in one day. And then uh, that next uh, spring, we had a fire that came right into Ely, Minnesota, uh, uh, my little hometown there. And our, our town is the fire suppression capital of northeastern Minnesota, and that fire almost overran the town. Uh, luckily, the DNR water bombers uh, saved the day and showed up. Uh, but two weeks later, in Duluth, Minnesota, which is uh, you know just 100 miles away from there, we, we had, uh, I think it was like 12 inches of rain in uh, a very short period of time. It was a, it was a biblical deluge that, that caused hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage. So we went from uh, forest fire drought to flood, uh, and we're seeing this all over the country. I also have been speaking to the, in the public on this for over 10 years, and I notice a big difference now in the public attitude on this because we are, we are exper experiencing these extremes. People are realizing that there are some changes. The droughts are quite serious because, uh, for one, our, our food supply relies on our crops. Uh, the desert southwest is uh, a real critical area right now. Uh, California now is in, still in extreme uh, drought. We'd, we were fortunate a little bit in the northwest and the midwest this year to get some rain, but uh, the drought is right at our doorstep still. And then the weather systems, this is a Hurricane Sandy, what was, a, what was called a superstorm. The reason it was a superstorm was the water off the coast of New York, uh, New Jersey there was almost the same temperatures as, as what it normally is off the coast of uh, Florida. Uh, and this was because of the warmer water, the, the climate change, and that bred much, much stronger, um, much stronger uh, storm. Let's see what we got here. And then, okay, let's talk about solutions. Uh, uh, there's two areas in which this, uh, the ma major solutions. One is conserving the, uh, the energy that we do have. And the conservation of energy is anything from, any way we use energy is going to change. Uh, better insulated windows, insulated, uh, re-insulating uh, buildings or new insulation on new buildings, uh, lighting systems. Um, all of this is going to be a, an incredible employer. Uh, I would predict uh, we get our act together on the energy front here in the economy. <clears throat> Probably about a third of our young people will be working in, uh, in one way or another in, in this energy sector. So conservation of the energy is really one step. And then the second part of that is uh, getting our energy sources from clean sources. Uh, of course, wind is uh, the most obvious one. Uh, here in Minnesota, um, we went, uh, I believe, in about four or five years ago, we were 4% uh, uh, our electricity came from wind. Uh, right now, it's 13%, pushing almost 14%. Uh, we have a great economy, bringing in millions of dollars to our state, employing thousands of people. Uh, it's really a win-win. Minnesota is a real good example because we don't have any fossil fuels under our ground. Uh, we spend $20 billion a year on fossil fuels. Of course, that majority of that money goes outside of our state. 
So within our state now, we are starting to, uh, through our renewables, we're starting to capture a percentage of that. Within 20 years, we'll probably have about 18 million, a billion of that will be out of our renew our own renewables, which is uh, our own our own uh, local economy. Solar is really starting to take off now. Um, you're going to see this in the next, uh, right now it's happening, but by five years from now, the price of solar is dropping. Um, uh, the, the solar boom, uh, the installation, the maintenance of solar, uh, it's going to be a huge industry. I would predict that uh, within 10 years, most of our flat roofs uh, in our cities will be solar. Uh, you'll see the panels all over. And the, exact, the uh, advantage of, of solar is it's local power. You, you don't rely on transmission lines. Uh, you're not losing energy and, and costs and money by transmission lines. It's, it's local power, and especially when you need it. In the summertime, there's a huge energy drag uh, because of the air conditioning, and, and solar can pick up a lot of this extra um, energy need at that time. And um, of course, uh, the Will Steger Foundation here, um, we work in three areas, the uh, area that we're uh, in education curriculum, we work with teachers. One area, we work a lot in uh, youth uh, leadership, both in high school and, and college. And a lot of this work is around policy. And then the, the third area that we work in is climate and energy policy. We work a lot behind the scenes moving uh, the Midwest and Minnesota, and this was one of the rallies here we had. I think it was, was this at Washington, D.C.? Or? I think it was here. And um, and then we do a lot of work in the classroom, and um, right, I think we're right on time here. And um, And I said, do we still have everybody online here? <laughs> everybody out there? I'll read, I'll read some of the lines here. Kristen, are you there? I think I'm, I'm, I'm coming back on. Okay. Am I there? Can you hear me? I can hear you here. Great. Great. Well, thanks, Well. My pleasure. Um, <laughs> thanks for <laughs> being here with us tonight and um, like I said earlier one of the goals of, of this webinar series is we wanted to make sure that um, we were able to provide you guys all out there around the world with um, not only some really provoking content but access and some ideas for some resources of, of how to talk about this yourself um, with people that you know and also maybe with the students that that you work with um, Will's story has really, here in Minnesota, motivated thousands to really care about our state. And it was really those early observations of the natural world that you saw earlier in his webinar, his curiosity about weather and climate, that enabled him to get out there and explore and survive, actually, in the polar, polar regions. These critical skills and a good understanding of weather and climate are important for everyone to know and understand. And data collection, asking good questions about the natural world, and then being able to develop investigations to answer them are integral to those of us that are in classroom settings, the next generation science standards, um, and documentation, description. Those are all brought, come, bring in the common core language arts, as well as art and math and, and all the, the different subject areas. So I wanted to share a little bit <clears throat> briefly about a program that we were able to work with that might inspire you um, for a program back where you are and, and show you some resources we use. So we were able to participate in a program for a few years sponsored um, by the National Park Foundation called the Parks Climate Challenge. And this program helped us prepare teachers and their students to be their own eyewitnesses um, of climate change in their school and in their community and, and in, the, in the national park that we have here in the Twin Cities, the Mississippi National River and, and Recreation Area. And um, through this partnership, we were able to train over 100 teachers and get over 1,000 students outside making observations of the natural world. And so the way the, the, the project ran is we started out with a summer educator institute. We ran these for three summers. We do do institutes. We've been running them for actually eight years, but these particular um, trainings were focused on this program. 
we um, the institutes were uh, based on developing educator confidence and competence in delivering climate change education in their educational setting. And you can get a nice uh, overview of, of the institutes on our website, and we'll be sharing those through the, the resources page associated with this webinar. The, <clears throat> the institutes featured our Minnesota's Changing Climate Curriculum, which Will had mentioned earlier, which is a six lesson module that has an emphasis on documentation, getting students outside, and the impact of, of climate change on Minnesota's biomes. And you're able to, to check that out from the website listed there and download it for free if you're interested. Um, but for those of you that aren't in Minnesota, there was a very deliberate framework behind that curriculum. And it was a focus on connecting students with the place that they lived in, uh, thinking about what defined that place, how it's changed over time. And we could talk in, in geologic time, we could talk in more current time, uh, defining our place then according to biotic factors and abiotic factors. Um, how has our place changed? What's causing that change? And then looking at data, understanding how do we know our place is changing? What, what does the data show? Um, and, and how can we make our own observations or experience this ourselves? And then finally, looking at our place and saying, what can we do? What kind of action can we take um, in, in our place? And so this model is something that you, know, you can apply in, in any setting and thinking about how can I connect people, my students, with, with the impacts of climate change, and then what can I do about it? Following that training, then, the, they implemented the, the curriculum in their classrooms. Um, some of them did the entire module. Some of them did different piece, pieces of that. And then um, a, a number of them were able to bring their students on a field trip back then to the river setting. Um, you can see here John doing some weather data collection at a, a, the, a weather station we were able to, to put in there. We also had a service project, students remo uh, removing invasive species, which of course are becoming worse, um, many of them with the impacts of with climate change, with the warming. Um, other students, though, didn't, weren't able to go on field trips, but they actually did observations in their own classroom, out, outside their own classrooms in their, in their schoolyards and also in their communities. And then they posted those reflections on uh, an online, very informal blog site, which you can see the, the, the link below that where you can check out some of their reflections. Um, like I said, those are pretty informal, and so I wanted to just make sure you are all aware of, of places where you could actually do some really very um, deliberate data collection yourselves and contribute to a greater body of it. The links to all these um, sites as well as others are, are up on our um, education resource page associated with the webinar. But these are some great opportunities for you to involve not only yourself, or your students in, in data collection and contributing really to the, the body of evidence of what we know and being an eyewitness yourself to, to the impacts of climate change um, and how it's changing the, the natural world around us. I wanted to also point out for those of you interested in, um, in the polar regions, we do have an online Arctic community curriculum which can be accessed from the, the web um, link below. And, um, and this gives an, an in-depth look at different communities within the Arctic, including explorers, scientists, animals, and the people that live there. And with that, I'm going to hold off there for a minute and um, take some questions if we have any. Um, and I can scroll back through them here. Um, it looks like... Is the presentation being recorded? John didn't answer that. Yes, it is. Um, and it will be available on in the web resources page and we'll email it out to everyone in this webinar. Are the photos and videos that will shared available for us to find online? Um, some of them are and some of them are not. And um, I don't know what if Will- pre you press room, I think, or is it the press room in the website? John, mm -hmm. we can access that. There no. are, yeah.
There are, uh, there, so we have a press room on our website, but we'll provide a link to that that has a number of the Arctic photos there. The gym um, chasing ice, um, a lot of those videos are also available online that Will showed. And we can provide links to those as well. Yeah, I, I do believe we have a lot of videos available too, and, and uh, John can send out that link. So there's, there's a lot of material there. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions that, that people had about Will's presentation? I see there's some, Brian Bloom is typing. Different people are, are typing in some questions. So I'll just take a second and wait for those to come through. I guess I'm waiting for, for some of those. Oh. Are the links to information about data collection and support available on the website? Yep, so there'll be, there's a resources page, which I'll post here. I think I can post in a second. Um, it's just being updated tonight, and it will be finalized probably by next week, but it will have all the, the different resources that, um, that I talked about this evening. So all of those will be posted. Okay, great, thanks. All right, well, I'm going to keep talking. If you think of any other questions that you might have for Will, um, go ahead and type them. And I'm just going to kind of conclude some things here just to let you all know that we are hosting an institute this summer for, for educators. And we would love to have you come on over to Minnesota if you're not here or come to the <laughs> institute if you're in Minnesota. The information can be found there and registration is open. It's, um, it will be three days. And there's two tracks, one focused on climate change on the, and one more focused uh, specifically on energy education. Um, if you haven't already registered for the next webinar in our series, the next one's going to be fantastic. We have students from the School of Environmental Studies um, coming to speak with us about their experience at um, COP18 or COP19. And their teacher will be there as well. If you're not familiar with COP, the Conference of the Parties is the United Nations Climate Change Conference that occurs every year. Um, their teacher will also be coming to just talk about the impact that this has on students because he's been doing this for the last five years, bringing students there. So it should be great. So you should check that out. Oh, I see someone's highly recommending the Institute. Thank you very much. Um, and then there is a survey which um, I'm kind of working on right now. You can try and take it. We'd love for you to take it um, and resources from this webinar, but we'll be sending the link out for the, for the survey and for the resources to you, um, to those of you that took the webinar this evening, um, tomorrow as well. And with that, is there any other questions that people have before we close out for the evening? because we have a couple more minutes then left. It looks like five, four, three, two, one. Looks like, oh. Yep, yep, Are there additional in. materials available for community-based <laughs> curriculum material? Uh, community, i.e. materials for public education. So um, there are, I would say that um, our curriculum that we have available is would be perfectly appropriate in many public education settings. It's got background information. It's got activities. We do it with teachers who are adults. We do a lot of those activities to help teach them about climate change. Um, and so I would suggest looking at that. I would also say, I'm not sure, Jody, if you're in Minnesota or not. Are you in Minnesota? Um, we have a public education program. She, great, Jody's in Duluth. So Jody, um, if all goes well and our proposal goes through the legislature, we will be launching a project in uh, July called Minnesota Stories in a Changing Climate, which is a public education um, on outreach project on climate change for the state of Minnesota. And it's funded through the uh, legislative Citizens Commission on Minnesota's Resources, and we're really excited about it. And there'll be materials and forums that we'll be doing um, around the state. So stay tuned and check out our resources for that. It should be, we're really excited about that. Um, Jenna, 
I teach middle school. Um, uh, how do you suggest I teach climate change to that age group? Middle school is a great age to be teaching about climate change. Um, I know here, once again, I'm not sure where you are, Jenna, but um, in Minnesota, um, earth science is part of um, St. Michael. Okay, there you go. You're in Minnesota as well. Um, earth science tends to be a subject that fits in well in middle school. Um, as far as doom and gloom, um, integrating, as, as Will was talking about it, some discussion then about solutions and what you can do with your students to make a difference and make a change, I think is what's really important. It's what we try to talk about here um, at our institute when we talk to teachers about teaching climate change. And um, students at that age are just like, they're ready to do something and, and come up with innovative new ideas and encouraging them to do that, I think is, is absolutely important and actually really exciting. Um, we get a little bit more into those parts in our institute, but there are some more action resources in, in, our, in our webpage you should check out, but also feel free to get in touch with us. St. Michael isn't so far from the Twin Cities and we'd love to talk with you about, about ways to do that. I'd like to connect with you on this. We're leading to lose George Sean. Great. Jody, get in touch with me. Send me an email. Um, Will also mentioned conservation and renewable resources. Are there any specific projects you suggest for elementary middle school? The um, our experience energy curriculum, which is also you can access through, is that what you just oh contact if John, if you want to post the link to that. Um, has some great um, um, activities as far as doing audits with your students of your school and looking at the ener energy that is being used there. Um, we actually check out, if you're in this area, um, watt meters for you to kind of look at the use of energy in your classroom and, and in your school, if that's something you're interested in. Um, there's activities about developing action plans, and sharing them. We have case studies in that curriculum of students here in Minnesota and the things that they actually did in their old school. Um, so hopefully some of those suggestions are, are useful. I'm talking off the top of my head. Experience energy, there you go. Great. Well, we're coming to the end of the hour here. Um, please feel free to um, Get in touch with us here uh, via email or calling our office. We're always here to talk. We hope to see you at our next webinar series on, what day is it, John? It's Webinar Wednesday, we know that. February something. <laughs> um, and coming. is it coming? February, he's running it up. Want me to tell him? Go to the beginning here. Oh, there it was. February 12th. February 12th. There we go. And many, many thanks to Will Steger for being here with us this evening. My pleasure. My pleasure. And great. And we will 